Everybody got quiet. I guess we ought to start. Let's stand together. It's wonderful to see you tonight. I hope you had a good day and that the Lord's blessing. Have you enjoyed a little bit of cooler weather? Man, that's always nice. Always, always, always good. Okay, let's uh, pray together and then I'll let you guys greet one another if you haven't already. Father, we want to come to you tonight because you know what we need. And you know the deepest needs of our heart. And I thank you, Lord, that you stand ready to meet those needs. And so we're turning to you tonight because we can't fix what's wrong and we can't minister to what needs to be ministered to. Only you can. So, dear Holy Spirit, would you please move and move freely? Would you give us ears to hear? Would you give us the ability to enjoy our salvation tonight and to be fed and to be strengthened by fellowship and by the Word of God? Would you give us the ability to have insight so that we pray with power and with authority? And Lord, may everything be done in grace. And we pray all of this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's spend some time greeting one another tonight. Sacrifice. 
sacrifice to you. Lord, we offer our prayers and we offer our lives in gratitude for all you do. We worship you with a thankful heart, with a thankful heart, we will give you praise. You've been so good, covered us with grace. You have been our strength in a time so dark. So we worship you. With a thankful heart So we lift up our praise And we lift up our sacrifice to you Lord, we offer our prayers And we offer our lives in gratitude For all you do we worship you with a thankful heart. We worship you with a thankful heart. Let the rain of your presence fall on me every day that I live. With every breath I breathe, let the rain of your presence fall on me. Everywhere that I go, Lord, let your presence flow, rain on me. Love divine. presence. Let the rain of your presence fall on me. Every day that I live, with every breath I breathe, let the rain of your presence fall on me. Everywhere that I go, Flow, rain on me. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day. On the road to Calvary, tried by sinful man, torn and beaten land, nailed to a cross of wood. Is the power? Oh. 
things coming up. Of course, this weekend, Dr. Robert Smith Jr. will be here. Guys, we should all be signed up. It's not too late to sign up, but Brother Robert will be meeting with us Saturday night. We'll meet at 5.30 and have hamburgers, all the fixings, and then homemade ice cream. And then we're going to wake back up, and we're going to listen to Dr. Smith's teaching. So that will be a fun time. If you're not signed up, it is not too late to sign up yourself and also to bring a guest. So do that this evening before you leave, Pastor. Yeah, I'm excited about this weekend. Uh, Brother Robert's excited too. That's always a good thing. I uh, hesitate to feed people and then have a guest speak because people go into kind of like that eating homemade ice cream. You're going to go into an ice cream coma and, you know, throw it out to him. There was one time when we first started doing our Thanksgiving meals after we built that building back there, there was one time, one time that I had Brother Carl, uh, we ate and then we came back in here for a service after eating turkey, it was horrible. I felt so sorry for him, and I said, I'll never do that to anybody else as long as I live. So at least we're not having turkey burgers, or we might be in real trouble. So uh, guys, we'll look forward to that. It'll be a lot of fun. Okay, I want you to turn to the book of Philippians tonight. And I feel led to take Wednesday nights and just kind of uh, go through the book of Philippians. What a great little book. And uh, it's one of the happy books that Paul writes. Some of them are not so happy. Second Corinthians is a, 
Uh, it's a hard one to kind of get through. And some of them are real heavy and weighty. This is not. This will just be encouraging as we, as we walk through this. And um, it's a short book, as you know. And it's filled with joy and uh, a lot of good things. He doesn't... Um, I'm trying to think in here. I'm not sure that there's a rebuke really in the book. Uh, he kind of writes a little bit different, has a different thing um, going on with this particular church as opposed to some of the other ones. Um, if you remember back in um, oh, somewhere around the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, as Paul is traveling, he gets to Philippi. Philippi was kind of a, a mini Rome, okay? a, a miniature Rome. And it was set up like Rome and had the same basic culture as Rome. And so it was not real uh, uh, Christian friendly or Jewish friendly, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, they worshiped the gods of, of the Roman Empire. Um, what, Zeus and um, Apollos and Aphrodite and all of those. I know they had Greek names and Roman names. I never can remember which ones they are, but same, same gods and goddesses. And um, in fact, uh, unlike other places where Paul went, you know, it was his pattern. Everywhere he went, he would go and he would hunt up a synagogue and he would worship with them. And as a visiting uh, rabbi who also was tremendously educated, they would usually ask him to speak. And so he would take an Old Testament passage and show how Christ fulfilled it. Well, you know, that went over like a lead balloon. Caused him a lot of trouble in the places that he went. Philippi was different. Philippi is that place where he goes and there were not even enough Jews there to have a synagogue. You had to have ten men in order to put together a synagogue. Well, there weren't even that many Jewish men in this uh, colony of Rome. And so he goes out where it was traditional for Jews to go. If they didn't go to the synagogue, they would go to the river. Kind of like Psalm 1. And... Um, he goes there and he meets Lydia and those, and it was a, a neat thing. But you also remember that's the place where he was uh, walking along and this demon-possessed lady kept coming up behind him and talking and interrupting and saying things. And uh, you remember he turned around and rebuked the demon and it left her. And when the demon left, she lost all of her powers, uh, the occult powers of fortune-telling, which kind of gives you an idea don't go have your palm read. It's either tremendously fake or it's demonic. Don't use a crystal ball or tarot cards or anything like that. That's demonic. Those are occultic things. And uh, when that demon was gone, she lost her power. Well, that ticked them off because she was their uh, uh, golden goose that was laying the egg for them. And uh, Paul had destroyed the golden goose that was laying their eggs or the goose that was laying the golden eggs, excuse me. And they got mad. And you remember it started causing trouble and Paul is arrested, he and Silas, and they are taken into the prison, they're beaten, and then they're put into the inside of the prison, into the dungeon area, and they're bound hand and foot. And uh, can you imagine, uh, it was illegal for them to be beaten because they were Roman citizens, and uh, now they're there without even a Tylenol, and uh, they're bound up. Can you imagine what it must be like not being able to move freely or anything like that, especially when you're hurt? And it was at that time that they started singing hymns at midnight. Remember what happened? Earthquake. The Philippian jailer is uh, afraid. They're all gone. This is a disaster. He's about to kill himself. Uh, under Roman law, as I understand it, if you were in charge of a prisoner and the prisoner got away, whatever sentence the prisoner would have comes upon you. So if it was a you know, 30, day in, 30 day in jail thing, well then you took his sentence. You spent 30 days in jail. If it was a capital offense, then you were executed. Well, apparently there were people in that prison that were supposed to be executed. The Philippian jailer says, I'm not going to let them do this to me. I want to Go ahead and just kill myself. And Paul says, do yourself no harm. Remember that? We're all here. And that was an amazing thing. That was, a, that was probably a greater miracle than the earthquake. The fact that the prisoners were all still there. And um, the Philippian jailer gets on his knees and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Remember that? And Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And the jailer takes him to his own house. And uh, his family members get saved and they're baptized and they wash their wounds and everything. And that's when, to their horror, they find out that Paul is a Roman citizen. Well, the next day, uh, 
they're talking to some of the officials there, and one of them is kind of uh, apparently kind of testing him to see. He goes, well, I paid a great deal for my citizenship. Paul said, I was born a Roman citizen, which means he came from a wealthy family, a well-connected family, and this terrified the Philippian officials. They would be in trouble from Rome for doing this to a Roman citizen, especially one who was born a Roman citizen. It had apparently had been in his family for at least a generation. So they want to try to say, you know, why don't we just, you know, forget about this and smooth it over? You know, is let bygones be bygones. It's always interesting how quick to reconcile people are when they're in trouble. And that's what they tried to do. And uh, so this is one of those things where Philippi was not a real good experience for the Apostle Paul. I think as you would put yourself in Paul's shoes, having to leave and uh, have after all that that he had been through, when Philippi came up, what would you think of? Now you can choose to focus on one of many things, let's just boil that down to one or two, you can focus upon the bad or you can focus upon the good. And apparently as we read through this letter, Paul made a choice not to focus upon the beating, not to focus upon the imprisonment, not to focus upon the injustice of the whole situation, but to focus upon the believers there, of which that Philippian jailer would have been one in this church, and those kind of people. And so uh, what a sweet thing it was that the Apostle Paul could say, I'm not going to be a victim and identify myself with all of the bad things. I'm sure he had some scars from the beating that he received. He had vivid memories, a brilliant man. But he chose not to focus upon that. He focused upon the people. And as he writes this letter, we're just going to look at his introduction tonight as he identifies himself. They wrote their letters in the New Testament era different than we do. We make you read a letter and look at the very end. How many times have you skipped the whole letter just to see who wrote it? Uh, They went ahead and told you right up front. And so true to form, Paul writes this. And in verse 1 of chapter 1, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, To all the saints in Christ Jesus, and he always loves to say in the Lord or in Christ or in God in all of his letters, who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Sounds like John MacArthur, doesn't it? Uh, That's his introduction. And before he gets into anything else, that's what he has to say. Is there anything significant? Is there anything important in those couple of verses? Well, there really are. It gives us a lot of insight into Paul and how he thought, how he thought about himself, how he thought about others, what he thought about leadership, and what he thought about his assignment. And that's basically what we're going to look at tonight. Because when Paul begins to uh, uh, write the letter as he signs his name, his and Timothy's name, he's telling us a little bit about himself. And uh, the first thing that we want to say is, how did Paul identify himself? How did he see himself? Now, when he writes to some churches, he says, Paul, an apostle called by God. In other words, I'm writing this and you better listen. I know a bunch of you knuckleheads are not listening. You better pay attention to this. And he kind of pulls rank on them and cracks the whip. If you're dealing with hard-headed knuckleheads like the Corinthians, you probably have to do that. You probably have to kind of get their attention before they're going to pay attention. Uh, Not at Philippi. At Philippi, you'll notice here that all he says is, this is who I am, and I'm with Timothy. And he's writing it more in a friendly way. In a way to where he knows these people love him, he loves them. There's not any resistance. There's not any of that kind of junk going on that have been in the other ones. In fact, when he calls himself here, not an apostle, but he calls himself a bondservant in the New King James. That is a very, very, very poor translation. Very poor. The Greek word is doulos. You know what doulos means? S-L-A-V-E. You see, a servant can come put in his job, put in his time, do his job, and then leave and go home, come back later on. Servant can ask for vacation for some time off, and that kind of thing. A slave can't. A slave is owned by his master, and he is to be available any time the master wants him. And Paul says, that's the word I'm using. Paul and Timothy, we are slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
We're not here to do our own will. We're not here to do what's convenient. We're not here to do what other people expect of us. We're not here to do what's popular. We're not here to do what's going to make us feel good. We are here at the command of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, that word uh, doulos is a good description of what it means to be a Christian. You are enslaving yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been set free. That's an interesting thing. Set free from the powers of darkness. Set free from the kingdom of darkness. Set free from sin. Set free from the power of your old nature. Only to do what? To submit yourself to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Lord means master, boss. And that's what it means. You are the boss. I am your slave. I am at your disposal. That's how Paul identified himself. He didn't identify himself by success or failure. He didn't identify himself by what other people thought of him or what his mom or dad thought of him. He didn't identify himself by his scars. He didn't identify himself by the injustices that had been done to him. You know, a lot of people do that. They can't ever get over their past. Always identified, always held back by what has hurt them before. Well, we're supposed to be different than that because we are understanding that everything we do as believers is ordained of God. He is the one who says he orders our steps, remember? So it was no accident that Paul was in Philippi. It was no accident that he was mistreated in Philippi. It was no accident that he was beaten and imprisoned. It was no accident that they sang hymns at midnight. It was no accident that there was an earthquake while Paul was there. And it was no accident that the Philippian jailer is there to get saved. In fact, Paul would probably look at this and say, we are slaves to Christ and we are so happy that the Philippian jailer is now a brother in the Lord, we would do this a thousand times over. That's what's important. We were there and all of that happened to us to be in the right place at the right time to tell him about Jesus and he becomes a brother in the Lord. I I think about how many times we don't want to even be inconvenienced about anything And yet if we were that surrendered to the Lord, would the Lord use us even in the midst of suffering, pain, trial, scars, those times when other people betray us, when other people misuse us, can there be something good that comes out of it? And I think that you look through the Bible and the biblical record is full of stories of people that were horribly mistreated. And yet when you look at the end of it, because they were submitted to the Lord, what did the Lord do? He brought beauty out of ashes. He restored the years that the locusts have eaten. He made all things new. And Joseph is a great example of that in the Old Testament. And I would encourage you to think about that and think about your identity. You are in Christ. And to think about the fact that you are a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. He can use you anywhere, anytime, under any circumstances, good or bad. And he does it for his glory because slaves don't have rights. And slaves don't get to pick their assignments. This is something that they do. And Paul did it in a joyful way. He counted it an honor to be a slave. Now it's interesting that as he writes to these people, as he describes himself, he sort of puts himself down. I'm just a slave. I'm just a common, ordinary slave. But notice what he does when he identifies the Philippians. This is something that we probably need to learn. So many times we try to puff ourselves up and make ourselves more important. We need to do what Paul did. Go ahead and lower yourself and build up other people. Lower yourself and build them up. See, Lower yourself and build them up. That's exactly what he does here. Because he says... um, To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. Now when you talk about a saint, that's interesting. Because we think of people, if you come from a Catholic background, you might think of a statue. You might think of a medal that you wear around your neck. And you might pray to the saint, the patron saint of travelers or the sick or something like that. They have a lot of different saints. Um, A saint in that context would be this person who's kind of, they're not your average run-of-the-mill Catholic, they're kind of a cut above, a little bit better. They have to have a miracle, they have to have different things happen, and they have to be confirmed uh, as a saint, and a certain period of time has to go by, all of that kind of stuff. 
And uh, sometimes you'll see saints in people's homes or on the dashboard of their car or worn around their neck in a, in a necklace or something like that. It gives us kind of a weird picture of saints. They always have this little thing around their head, you know, when they hold their hands a certain way and they look like they've been sucking uh, dill pickle juice, you know, and uh, it's kind of, you know, nobody wants to be a saint. In fact, Billy Joel said one time, I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints. The sinners are much more fun and only the good die young. It's kind of the way people think, isn't it? And whenever you talk to someone about being a saint, it just kind of sounds sort of like, mm, I don't know that I want to be that or not. Do you know, none of what I have just said has anything to do with the Bible. The Bible word for saint, did you know it can be translated, the Greek word hagios can be translated saint, it can be translated holy. Oh, wow. To all who are Holy in Christ Jesus. But see, for us in our culture, holy kind of sounds, oh, you know, like one of those weird old movies that you might have seen when you were a kid or something. Like, oh, I'm not sure I want to be that either. That sounds like a person who never can do anything, never has any fun, always kind of, you know, I don't do that, and looks down their nose at other people, judgmental, condemning, and all of that. It doesn't it? I mean, honestly. Saint and holy doesn't, doesn't really... Doesn't really minister to uh, us in our culture if we're not careful. Okay, well, let's do a, another definition, the most literal definition of it. It was not necessarily a religious term, this word hagios. It literally means, and the Hebrew word, I forgot what it is, but it means the same thing. It means set apart. So if you were, uh, you had a bowl of M&Ms and you like the red ones, okay? And for you, maybe you're a little kid and you're convinced the red ones taste different than the other ones do. And so what do you do if you want the red ones and you really like the red ones? You pick the red ones out and you set them aside for yourself. It could be the same thing with anything. Maybe you have some toys when you were a little kid that you liked and you had all your cousins, your bratty cousins coming over. You didn't want your toys messed up. So you took the ones you really liked and what did you do? You set them apart for yourself. Maybe you hit them under your bed or in your closet or something like that. You don't want those other people getting their hands on it. It could be the kind of thing that maybe you go to the store and uh, do you like peaches? Anybody like peaches? Man, they're good. I love peaches. Except when you go to the store and you get them and they're hard and they taste weird and they feel weird and all of that. That is, that is no good. That's disgusting. But when you get those that are just a little bit soft... And they're kind of ripe. And when you bite into it, the juice kind of runs out of it. And it's really sweet. Oh, man, that is good. Really, really, really good. And so when you go to the store, what do you do? You just go up there and say, oh, we got peaches. And just, you know, whatever comes into your bag is what you take. No, you pick them out. And you set them apart for what you want them for. I mean, there are any kind of, any number of things we could do. Some of you may have collected coins and uh, there may be a time when you were looking for those pennies. Remember the pennies with the wheat on the back of them? And somebody told us when we were kids those kind were more valuable than others. Well, they were. They were worth about a cent and a half. And, uh, you know, but we would look through pennies and try to find those. Sometimes you would uh, read in Boy's Life. I was a Boy Scout. Anybody read Boy's Life? And you would look in there and they would tell you that there's a certain quarter and there was a letter on it that was backward, and it was worth $5,000. Oh, man, we would look through every quarter we had to try to find something like that. I mean, you just knew one of these days you were going to find that special one that was going to make you a millionaire. Uh, you would set that, if you ever found a quarter like that, you would set it apart. You would hagios it. You would saint it, sanctify it. You would holy it. I know that sounds kind of weird. It just means set apart. In the Old Testament sacrifices, if you were going to give a tithe to the Lord, they didn't generally give money. What they do is give the first fruits of their increase. So if you went out and you were a farmer and your crop came in, the first 10% was what? It was set apart. It was holy unto the Lord. Okay? It was holy, set apart. This is God's. And this is going to be taken to the temple or to the tabernacle. It's going to be offered to the Lord. The lambs, this is the one that is set apart for the Lord. Don't eat that one. Don't let that one go. Don't just feed that one any old run of the mill. This lamb is special. This is the one for the Passover. This is the one that is going to be offered to the Lord. That's the word that Paul uses when he describes the people at Philippi in the church. You are the ones chosen and set apart as holy 
unto the Lord. And there's also a little bit of a sacrificial uh, inference there. Your life is there to be a sacrifice unto Christ. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. You are the one that is set apart for his use, for his work. It's kind of a nicer way of saying the same thing he said about himself. I'm a slave. What does a slave do? A slave is set apart for whatever the master wants to do. Well, what is he saying to the uh, Philippians? You too are set apart. He just uses a nicer word. He puts himself down. He builds other people up. Well, if we could ever learn to do that, how different would our lives and our relationships be? Putting ourselves down, humbling ourselves, building other people up, and viewing other people as those who are called and saved, chosen, set apart, and useful to the Lord. It's interesting that as skunky as a church that uh, Corinth was, Paul, when he talks to them, he identifies them in the same way that he does with the Philippians. And there they were living horrible lives. But he saw them through the eyes of Jesus. He saw them according to their calling and according to their salvation. Boy, wouldn't it make a difference if we looked at one another instead of looking at people through the eyes of how much money they have, how good looking they are, how talented they are, how creative they are, how influential they are. If we just would say, I love you because I see you as one who is set apart for God's use, paid for by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, indwelt by the Spirit of God, and you are one whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You are precious to the Lord, therefore you are precious to me. That's what Paul's saying here. That's the way we ought to see each other. We ought to see ourselves in a certain way and identify ourselves the way God does, and we ought to identify others. Now, the next thing he does is he talks about worthy leadership. And he says, with the bishops and the deacons. Now, bishop there, that sounds kind of, you know, holy and stuffy. Sounds like a guy wearing robes and sitting on, you know, a throne and standing up and crossing himself or something like that. No, 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 no. Has nothing to do with that. And it's not a piece on a chessboard either. When he talks about bishop, it's the Greek word episkopos, which means overseer. The Episcopal Church names their church after that. They have bishops. And uh, Baptists don't typically have bishops. Because what's happened in a lot of denominations, what they've done is they've had like, okay, like you have a pope, okay, in the Roman Catholic system. And then you have cardinals, you know, kind of a little bit below pope, but, you know. And then you have uh, bishops after that. And then you have your ordinary run-of-the-mill priests, right? Well, in the New Testament, the word bishop and pastor and elder, all three mean exactly the same thing and are used interchangeably in the New Testament. Elders are pastors. Pastors are bishops. Bishops are elders and all of that. It goes on like that. I just described the different functions. See, the word elder, presbyteros, is a word that's talking about somebody who is a little older, mature, and wise. They can give leadership. The word bishop is one who oversees. They watch over the flock. The word pastor is poimen. It means a shepherd. The one who will feed and protect the flock and lead them. They're used interchangeably in the Bible. So he's talking here about uh, bishops and deacons. We know what deacons are. And uh, these are people that are qualified according to 1 Timothy chapter 3. The uh, pastor's qualifications or elder or bishop are listed first. And then the deacons. And they're right there side by side. Two offices in the church. And so Paul recognizes worthy leadership as not who can write the biggest checks. Not who is the most talented. We want to get the most talented out here, don't we? This is not a TV show. It's not recognizing leadership as those who are powerful and influential and strike fear into the hearts of of people That could be a CEO or a political leader or a military leader or something like that. He describes them as people who are called and qualified. Think of those two things. How do you know if a church leader is, is worth their salt? Because they're called of God and they're qualified to serve as the Bible qualifies it. It's not a popularity contest and it's not whether you and I think that they are doing a good job. It's whether they are qualified according to the scripture. And that's how Paul looked at leadership even. What is worthy leadership? Maybe not what the world does. Maybe not what other people might. Maybe somebody that doesn't look good on TV. Um, a friend of mine, 
he was the head of the ministerial alliance at Washita Baptist University, and they had uh, the pastor in that Sammy and I grew up under, Brother Andy. And Brother Andy was talking to those guys, and he said, I know what most of you want. You want to be on TV. You want to have a county seat church, and uh, you want to have a big congregation. And he goes, most of you are never going to make it. You know why? And they're all waiting for some big spiritual answer. And he goes, you're too ugly. And they all didn't know what to take of it. And you know what he was saying? Most of the time, churches will choose a pastor. And who is considered to be a good pastor or a good deacon, it's kind of like Israel choosing a king. You know, Saul is a head taller than everybody else. He'll look good leading us into battle. He was a disaster. And David is the guy that's just, he's no good for anything but keeping sheep, which was not a compliment back then. And he turned out to be Israel's greatest king. Even the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ one day says he will sit on the throne of his father David. Even in that, David is getting honor and top billing, isn't he? It's amazing. Because God looks upon the heart, looks differently than we do. So sometimes... The person that you think, boy, they must be a a great leader, a great deacon, a great pastor, a great elder. They may not be. And it may not be by the same standards that the world would have. It's a spiritual standard. So pray for your pastor and pray for your deacons and understand that. Because there's pressure sometimes to be what the world wants us to be. And even sometimes church people want us to be more like a CEO or a business operator or an entrepreneur or something like that. Paul didn't see it anything like that at all. He identified leadership much differently than we do. It was more by their character and their calling than it was anything else. Not by abilities or talents, but by character and calling, qualifications. And then you look at the fourth thing. And you're going to see that we ask the question here, how uh, do you um, identify your assignment? Notice as Paul talks to them, he says, grace to you and peace. And just so you don't get it mixed up, it's not grace to you and peace from Paul or from Timothy or from the church or from Jerusalem or for big shots like Peter. It comes from God the Father. It's even better than that. This is a better peace than I could give you. This is a better peace than circumstances could give you. This is not the peace of Rome. This is not the peace that comes from a president. This is not the peace that may come from wealth or uh, notoriety or anything like that. This is peace that comes from God. And it comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Paul saw himself as a pipe. A pipe that is connected to Jesus who is connected to the Father. And when the Father wants to pour an abundance of peace and grace out upon his people, what does he do? He just hooks an apostle up to it, and here it goes. Kind of like when you go out and water your lawn or water some of your bushes, you hook everything up, and and it's coming from maybe Oklahoma City or more, maybe coming from a lake, maybe coming from a well, something like that. And what does it do? It's coming through all of those things to get down to where you are so that you have water to put upon that bush. And you and I are like the hose. We're the water hose. Your pastor, your Sunday school teacher, people like that. We're just a hose. All we are is a conduit for the grace and the peace of God. But it doesn't come from us. Don't ever get that mixed up. Don't ever make that mistake of thinking that the water, oh, I've got such a great hose. Man, you ought to taste the water that comes out of my water hose. I've got a better water hose than anyone else. No, that's not really where it comes from. The hose doesn't purify it. The hose doesn't provide it. Nothing like that at all. All it is is a conduit as it comes from somewhere else. And so Paul looked at this with the Philippians. And I think he may have been asking the question as he is writing this letter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Maybe he's thinking something like this. I know I would be. I've already been to Philippi. Man, it was a rough experience. I had to leave. I didn't get to stay there very long. That was hard. I was in jail. I was beaten. I've still got scars from all of this. Lord, what more do you want me to do? What more can I do? And the Lord said, I want you to take your quill, and I want you to take your inkwell, and I want you to take some parchment, and I want you to start writing, and I'll tell you what to write. Because I want to give some more grace and some more peace to my people that have been called by my name who are in the body of Christ. And I want you to bless them. There's one more thing you can do. 
And I thought about that. There are a lot of things that we may think of with other people and with other ministries. And we may have done everything we can. We may have done the best we know how to do. And sometimes we're kind of quick like Pilate just to sort of wash our hands and say, well, there's nothing else I can do. You know what? Um, I doubt that we ever really get to that point. I think sometimes we need to get to the place of saying, I've done everything I know to do. What more can I do? Now, sometimes we ask that question like, what do you expect? What, what more can I possibly do? I don't think Paul would have ever done that. I think Paul would have said, Lord, I've done everything you assigned me to do. Is there anything else? Anything else? You know, sometimes you do that when you're helping somebody that you love. You're carrying in groceries for your wife. You know, you run the vacuum. You do something like that. And then you go, is there anything else? Anything else I can do? Maybe you do that when you stay at somebody's house. Hey, we cleaned up all of this kind of stuff. We made the bed and, you know, uh, we, we've got our linens, you know, and our towels and everything. Where do we, is there anything else I can do? When you have a good waiter or a waitress at a restaurant, they don't just come in and just kind of do the bare minimum. They're always asking, is there anything else I can do? And I think that's the way we are as believers, as slaves to the Lord. We say, that I've done everything that was required of me. Now, is there anything else I can do? What more can I do? I want to show you a video now that's about the power of one. But I've got to set it up because this video doesn't tell the whole story. It would be way too long if it did. There's uh, a guy named John O'Leary. John O'Leary is a motivational speaker. He's, oh, in his 40s maybe. He's got, uh, I think, four children, married, has four children, and um, speaks to a lot of corporations. Not terribly long ago, he spoke to the people that make Legos. That's kind of cool. Uh, if you think about that, I love Legos until I step on them, you know. And childbirth cannot possibly hurt as bad as stepping on a Lego with a bare foot in the middle of the night. So I don't want to hear anything. I've been through it myself. Uh, he's spoken to a lot of companies like this. But as you know, most of the time, whether it's a preacher or an effective teacher or a motivational speaker or somebody like that, there's usually a story behind it. And you know, um, the story usually hurts. This guy, John, nine years old, living in St. Louis. He's a Cardinals fan. And a little boy, nine years old, and he watched some neighbor kids. That's always a problem. You know what these neighbor kids, these older boys were doing? They would take a gas can, and they would pour gasoline on the sidewalk, and then they would step back a couple of feet and then flip a match over on him. <laughs> Well, man, that is impressive to a nine-year-old kid. I was kind of a firebug. Well, this kid, John, he went into his garage. He got a piece of cardboard. He lit the cardboard on fire. Parents weren't home. Uh, he went over to a five-gallon. Remember those big, round, metal gas cans? Five gallons of gas. Those are heavy, heavy for a nine-year-old kid. He lit the cardboard on fire, put it down, and he thought he would pour the gasoline on it and, and just have it just spark the life and do that, and it would be cool and impressive. He picks it up. He's holding it like this. And as he goes over like that, before the liquid ever comes out, fumes. You know, I had to learn the hard way when I was about 14 that the gas is not really your problem. It's the fumes. And that nine-year-old little boy, when he did that, the can caught on fire and exploded, went into two pieces. I saw pictures of it. It threw him back about 15 feet. He's covered in gasoline. He is on fire, nine years old. Well, you know, what are you supposed to do when you catch on fire? They tell you this in school. You stop, drop, and roll. What do you do when you're on fire? You run. He ran screaming into the house for help. He ran in through the kitchen and... On out there, and in fact, I saw a picture of the rug where he stopped. He didn't know what to do, and he's on fire. His brother said flames are out about two feet on either side of him from head to toe. His brother comes down and is able to take him and start smothering out the fire and wraps him in a, in a rug, and the house is on fire, and there's smoke all through the house, and he picks him up and he carries him outside. He said that while he was laying there, his little sister went back into the house and through the smoke and everything, can you imagine? And she came back out and she got water and she put water in his face to try to cool him off. He was taken by ambulance to the hospital 
And uh, there was one video I could have shown you, but the pictures are just too gruesome. Um, he is there, and they determined that he was burned on 100% of his body. 80% of his body was covered in third-degree burns. When his parents got there, the doctor explains everything and what all they have to do and all of that. And the mom says, I said to the doctor, so you're saying my son has about a 50-50 chance. The doctor said, no, you didn't listen to me. I said, he has a less than 1% chance of surviving the night. He was in the hospital for five and a half months. As a burn victim, every single day they would take him and they would put him in a tub of water to remove the bandages that were on him. And then they would have to clean him. Can you imagine how agonizing that was? And then they would have to put medicine on him and then redress his wounds. He said that sometimes they would stuff a towel into his mouth because he was screaming so loud. An hour and a half as a nine-year-old boy every day for all of that time. Now, as he tells the story, he says, Now, don't feel sorry for me so much because they would give me morphine and I would be fine. He said, I always felt sorry for those nurses. They would have to carry him. They would put him in a wheelchair. They would have to pull him in and out of that. They were the ones that had to do that. And they not only did it for him, but when they got through with him, they went 15 feet over here to another room and would do it for someone else. And that's how they spent their day. He said there was one guy who was a nurse that would, uh, he was a, 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 about a six foot something African American man that would pick him up and carry him over here. And, and he said his legs are dangling and letting blood flow down to his legs that were useless because all the muscle had been burned. And he would say to him, boy, you're going to walk again. Boy, you're going to walk again. And he said, and I would listen to him and think, you don't know what you're talking about. And he said, but there came a certain time I started believing him. Started believing him. And later on in this man's adulthood, he was speaking at a place in Alabama. And this place that he was speaking for found that nurse. And he got to meet him after 20-some years. And uh, man, it's a powerful, powerful thing. Because they asked him, he said, what was it that that man said to you? And John goes, boy, you will walk again. And they said, maybe it sounded a little more like this. And the guy spoke over the PA system. And man, it's a tear-jerking moment. But there was somebody else involved in this guy's life that he really credits for his survival. For his survival and his recovery. And it was the guy that was the voice of the St. Louis Cardinals. And he came to see John. And he came on that first night... And told him, said, kid, wake up. You're going to survive. And then he left. But that wasn't the end of it. Because he asked the question, what more can I do? And this video is going to tell the story of what he did for this kid who has covered third degree burns. 100% of his body, 80% third degree burns. Can you imagine? Had to learn to, had his, all of his fingers amputated. Had to learn to walk again. Had to learn to ride again. Feed himself again. All of that. And uh, you're going to be blessed by this story because I think Paul was this guy to that church. And I think God is calling us to be this guy to one another. Okay? Let this bless you. Kid, are you listening? <laughs> and I say very loudly back. And I hear my friend, who I'd never met before that day, say to me, Good, keep fighting. Keep fighting. Keep fighting. And then he gets up, he walks out of that room, he pulls the door shut, leans his head against the glass and just breaks down crying, which we all know is a sign of great weakness. Uh-uh. Baby, I think it's a sign of great strength. I mean, if you're crying at every party, we probably need to talk, okay? <laughs> and that, that may be too much emotion, maybe. 
but to occasionally, just baby, you let it rip and you meet someone where they are. That's what's really going on here. Jack wept. And one of the nurses came over to him, got down on her knees, looked up at the celebrity, and she said, Mr. Buck, are you okay? And he says, I'm not sure. The little boy won't make it, will he? And the nurse, and this is the expert, looks back up and says, Mr. Buck, there is absolutely not a chance. When this news comes into our life regarding our work, our relationships, our health, our children, our parents, whatever it may be, not a chance, not a chance, what we do next matters. What this person does, he takes it home, he cries, he prays, he reflects, and then he journals on a simple question. What more can I do? What more can I do? What more can I do? There's two ways to ask this. One is to throw your hands up in the air and say, what more can I do, man? I've done it all, I'm done. That's one way. But the way Jack chose to do it was completely out of love, knowing his why, knowing, knowing that there was one more thing to be done, that one person can, in fact, change the world through their life. What more can I do? And after getting his answer, he sleeps on it, wakes up in the morning, and delivers. The following morning, now it's Monday, I'm laying here in this hospital bed, bored. The door opens up. Somebody walks in, they sit down, they pull the chair up close, and then I hear this voice. Kid, wake up. I'm back. You are going to live. You are going to survive. Keep fighting. Keep fighting. Kid, see you soon. And the following day, he keeps his promise and he shows back up. For five months, this man kept serving and coming back and inspiring and impacting. This man changed my world, I think directly in many regards. He led to a miracle called homecoming. It was many people's work and many people's prayers and many people's love and encouragement, but Jack Buck stood up high, led to that picture up there. And then a month after homecoming, Man, we had to have a party. So we went downtown, we went to a place called Bush Stadium. That night, I had 13 Cokes, okay? 13 Cokes. But, but every single one of them came, not from my hands, because I, I can't hold anything. They came from my mom's. So Jack sees this little boy, he probably drinks too much, but he can't even do it himself because mom is holding that cup up to him with a little straw. He sees a little boy in a wheelchair who can't get out of it. Roy has tried, down the therapist are trying, but the little kid can't walk. He sees a little boy without fingers, with scars and splints all busted up. He sees it all, friends. And he sees the other side of the coin. And there is always the other side, always. When you look at the screens today, what jumps off it at you? Besides the goofy cardinal hat. The big goofy smile, do you see it? Cover it up. Do you still see it? And the eyes. The little dude is lit up, he's fired up. So Jack sees the joy and the hope, the spirit. And he sees the pain and the brokenness and the challenges and what he knows to be true and what you all know to be true they walk side by side. They come in step. They come together. They come married. Jack chooses to take home both, cry about both, pray about both, and then reflect on a singular question. What more can I do? What more can I do? What more can I do? As a consultant, as a parent, as a child, as a friend in the community, what more can I do? Journal on it answer it, take action. That's his secret. The following day, I'm at home with my mom and dad. Mom goes out, she comes back in with this baseball. 
below the ball from a guy named Ozzy Smith is a note from a fellow named Jack Buck. And the note says, <laughs> the note says, kid, if you want a second baseball, all you have to do is send a thank you letter to the man who signed the first one. Just one problem with that, Jack. What's the problem, Sensi? That's right, man. You don't have hands. You don't have fingers. You can't even hold a soda. You sure can't hold a pen. Do you think my mom and dad were trying to get me to write yes or no? You know, what they used to do every day is to walk into my room. They would get eye level with me like this. And my mom would try to hand me a pen. And she would say to me, baby, baby, when you learn how to write again, you get to go back to school. <laughs> Mom, I'll try when I'm up for it. I'll try. <laughs> do, do you think a little fella in Missouri is longing to go back to school? Is that his great goal in life? I ignored them. But what Jack did so beautifully is he did not call me up to where he was. He met me where I was, and there's a great difference between the two. He came all the way down to where this little kid was, met him in his why, asked the question, what more can I do, delivered this baseball, changed my world, changed my world. Do you think I wrote the note? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Let your yes be heard today. Yes. Mailed off that note. A couple days later, I got a second baseball with a second note. Kid, if you want a third baseball, all you have to do, Sensi, is send a thank you letter to the guy who signed the second. Mama, bring me a pen. Because <laughs> motivation is an inside job. And baby, I got my inspiration now. It's baseball. It is baseball. It's these little balls. I wrote another note, waited around, got a third baseball with a third note that said, what do you think it says? Louder, please. Kid, if you want a fourth baseball, all you have to do. This goes on day after day for the entire summer. And by the end of it, <laughs> isn't that cool? One man sent 60 baseballs to a little kid in a wheelchair with bright red skin and no chance, some people think, changing his world, allowing him to realize, yes, indeed, you can write again. You can, in fact, write again. He had to believe first, I followed. He gave those 60 baseballs, which led back to grade school. Grade school was followed by high school. Uh, four years there, followed by nine years at university. <laughs> Where... You tripped your way forward a little bit, but somehow you survived and you endured. You showed a little bit of spirit, and then somehow you graduate. And then graduation night, Sensi. <laughs> graduation night, one of the great miracles happens. The, the miracle, I think, is love. Love shows up. I, I never dated in grade school, middle school, high school, or college. That, that's a pretty long drought, okay? Like about a lifelong drop, a graduation night, she arrives on the scene and she's beautiful. And you've seen her already, so you know how the story ends. But as a kid, I didn't know how it was going to end up. Graduation night, though, she shows up. You ready for her? Here she comes. True story. She gorgeous? Jack Buck. Who'd you expect? Who'd you expect? Oftentimes, she's not what we expect. She's not oftentimes exactly what we expect. She shows up sometimes as a 19-year-old brunette that you're going to meet later on that summer named, named Elizabeth Grace. She's beautiful, but you haven't met her yet. Other times, she shows up as a 75-year-old male named Jack Buck with a great heart, 
Parkinson's disease and stage four lung cancer. That's sometimes what she looks like. What we all know though from our own experiences, from our own lives, is when she shows up in our life, love changes us. And when we show up as love for those lucky enough to be around us, we change them. We change them. That night, Jack Buck came as love with a package and a note. What, what do you think the first word on the note said? <laughs> you got to say that louder, please. Yeah. Oh, babe, show me some spirit. One more time. Yeah. Kid. Dude never knew my first name was John. Kid. <laughs> Kid. This means a lot to me. I hope it means a lot to you too. Enjoy. It's yours. So I, I open up this package, look inside. Whew, blows me away. Blows me away. And before I open up this package in front of each of you, I want you to realize the question that led to the gift. It, it led to him having a Hall of Fame career and a Hall of Fame life. It changed his world and those lucky enough to be around him, and it absolutely, absolutely will change ours too. The question that guided his life then and ours, I hope, what more can I do? What more? What one thing? What more can I do? For Sensi, the folks I get to serve on my team, for friends in the community, for family members, for myself, my spiritual journey, my faith life, in my health, with my finances. What more can I do? What more can I do? Okay, I'll try. Kid, this means a lot to me. Hope it means a lot to you too. Enjoy, it's yours. Kid, this is the baseball that I received when I went into the Hall of Fame. Don't drop it, it's priceless. <laughs> he, he gives this heirloom away to a 22-year-old kid who had no clue what he was gonna do in life. Changed my world again. His gift of love in many regards I think led to this picture. Because when you have felt such powerful love from those around you, finally, eventually, you might believe in yourself, which finally happened to me, which allowed me to make the greatest sale in my life, pictured on both screens. And then we enjoyed and opened up one of the greatest gifts in our life. This little boy. <clears throat> Named friends after one of the greatest individuals in our life. Jack, Jack. <laughs> little Jack. Jack now has a little brother named Patrick. And when I'm out of town traveling, I, I travel quite a bit for work. My wife hates when I'm gone. So what she does to punish me is she'll take my two handsome little guys and then she'll dress them. like that. <laughs> so when I get home, baby, I, I rip off those dresses. I don't know what else you call them. I get them back in their gear. They think they're power workers, man. They, they, these are great little boys. And I remind those two little boys to love on their little brother, Jack and Patrick and now Henry. You, you find, by the way, you find if you travel too frequently that two parents who have dark hair can have a child with blonde hair. That's gonna be at our 11th reunion when I come back, we're gonna talk about forgiveness. It's gonna be a great conversation. <laughs> we need to get the warmers ready, baby. We're gonna, we're gonna have a blast. I, I'm blessed and I gotta tell you that the gifts keep showing up. Henry, now we got a little baby girl named Grace. She, she is a handful. My kids are healthy. My, my marriage is healthy. Both of my parents are alive. My dad's got Parkinson's disease, but he is the most healthy person I know, alive in the spirit. He is a very good man. I'm blessed. We, look at our country. Look at this stadium. Look at your friends and family members around you. We are fortunate.
So here's a kid who had every reason just to lay there and die. And one person took an interest, kid, <laughs> and those baseballs, 60. Well, that's tenacity, isn't it? And um, this guy also was at his uh, graduation party from college. He was at his wedding. And uh, uh, then he, with his cancer, passed away. And uh, there's a thing you can look up on YouTube that shows his story uh, in a thing that was put together by the uh, Major League Baseball. And they talk about all of this and give you more details and all of that. But the power of one. And I want you to think tonight. I want you to take your newsletter. And I want you to look at the names that are on there. And then I want you to think about some names that are not on there. People that are going through some things that you know about. I want you to ask yourself the question, what more can I do? What more can I do? And I want you to see yourself like Paul saw himself as a slave of Christ. I want you to see that person as a person who is in Jesus Christ, a fellow believer that the Lord loves and died for. I want you to see that whatever it is that God calls you to do, he will equip you and qualify you to do, just like he did those bishops and deacons in Philippi. And I want you to see that you are the conduit, the hose, for grace and peace coming from where? God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. And realize that one person can make a tremendous difference. You see, this guy had the same goal that the parents did. But the kid wasn't listening to the parents. But he listened to that person. And be that person that God will bring you into somebody else's life that they might listen to. And don't listen to the ones you think they ought to be listening to. They may be listening to you. Will you be that conduit of grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ? Because one can make a tremendous difference. And here's the challenge. Be the one. Amen? Be the one. You may not be able to do much, but do what you can. What more can I do? So let's bow our heads and let's close our eyes. Father, as we think about these people that are on our list tonight, and we think about other people that are not on the list, but oh, our hearts hurt for them. People that are trapped in sin. People that are going through horrible problems in relationships and in their family. People who are going through health problems and financial reverses. All kinds of things. People who just maybe feel like they've been abandoned or not sure where they fit in. There are all kinds of things that we can pray for. Yes, we pray for healing. Yes, we pray for deliverance. Yes, we pray for provision. But Father, here's what we want to say. Would you so fill us with love that our prayer would be, I've done everything I know to do, Lord. What more can I do? Give us that one thing, that one thing that we can do for that one person that might actually change their lives. And if it's not somebody on this list, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a co-worker. We just want to be used by you to do what we can and to realize you bless even the small things that take place for your glory. So we're encouraged tonight and we're very, very blessed. And we thank you for this and ask you to bless others through us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Can you say amen to that? Okay. Chad, do you want to come on up here? And, uh, we have a presentation. This is always a good thing. You don't need a mic, do you? Yeah, I don't need a mic. You guys can hear me, right? <laughs> I'm loud. Uh, I'm going to present to you uh, Miss Ophelia Conway also known as Miss Susan's mother, <laughs> sitting right over there by Miss Susan. Uh, she is coming to us uh, from College Park Baptist Church in Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, Miss Susan and Michelle Trench counseled with her, and her testimony is good. So if you accept Miss Ophelia, uh, based on her letter from uh, College Park Baptist Church, <laughs> say amen. 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 All right. Thank you. So Welcome. Be sure and go by and uh, greet her and let her know. So I hope you've been encouraged tonight. Okay? So go forth and do likewise. Okay? Be that for somebody else.
for the glory of God. And his name is John O'Leary. If you want to look him up on YouTube, it's pretty interesting to see some of those things. And you might even see some of the gross pictures that are on there too. Okay? Thank you so much. You are dismissed. And uh, like I say, go forth and minister for the glory of God. Be the hose.